What's up, y'all? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we are exploring the cosmic horror of Event Horizon. Now, this one is a classic in my book, and it's crazy that this is from the same dude that made all those crummy Resident Evil movies. Well, the first one's not bad. Here, Paul W.S. Anderson, not P.T., showcases some impressive horror skills and creates a competent and at times quite frightening sci-fi horror flick. It's certainly of its time in some ways, but honestly, when I rewatched it, I was like, this movie kind of rules. Even just having Sam Neill and Lawrence Fishburne front and center as adversaries chewing the scenery and rattling off cheesy one-liners fills me with joy. So let's check out Event Horizon, breaking down the story including what exactly is haunting the ship and explaining the ending that leaves the fates of our survivors up in the air. A dark shadow takes over the Paramount Mountain logo, launching us right into the darkness of space. Driving percussion gives way to sweet thumping techno beats, courtesy of 1997. We're given a brief history into the development of space exploration. In 2015, the first colony was established on the moon. Man, sounds like we need to get a move on. A few decades later, commercial mining began on Mars. Then in 2040, the Event Horizon ship was launched to explore beyond the boundaries of our solar system. It disappeared without a trace around Neptune, and is described as the worst space disaster on record. Worst space disaster so far. Seven years later, the ship mysteriously reappears exactly where it vanished from, on the outskirts of the stormy Neptune. There's a flyby of the massive ship with a long connector in the middle. Mmm, don't you just love miniatures? Look at that bad boy. In the interior, there are no signs of life, and they have lost gravity, seeing objects floating in the air in crappy CG. On the main bridge, there's a man floating upside down. He begins to rotate, noticing that his body is covered in blood, and he screams. Weir wakes up from the dream, startled in bed. He instantly gazes upon photos of his wife, Claire. He takes one down and really gives it the once-over. I miss you, he says glumly, and he must really miss her seeing a whole ass shrine of pictures dedicated to her. Now, we don't know what happened there yet, but do get some clues when he's shaving. He stares concerningly to the bathtub, and the faucet slowly drips, implying that something happened in the tub regarding Claire. He enjoys himself a bowl of oatmeal, staring out into the vastness of space. We pull out, seeing several domicile pods interconnected like a space apartment complex, aka the daylight station, hovering in a low orbit above Earth. He gets a call from someone and is tasked to join the crew of the Lewis and Clark rescue ship to find out what happened on the event horizon. It's mission? Top secret. Sorry, can't tell you, guy. The crew aren't exactly pleased with their latest mission, as they were just about to have a well-deserved break. Smith finds it all ridiculous. I mean, can they at least go to Mars? Mars has women, right? Stark agrees. There is nothing out by Neptune. Captain Miller puts them in their places. You know the rules. If someone calls, we go. Weir tries to say something, but Miller and the crew are too busy getting ready for lockdown. They are then loaded into suspended animation chambers, or gravity couches. It's Weir's first time and he's a little nervous. DJ checks him out and gives him a massive injection. He's also a bit concerned that Miller doesn't like him already and they joke, eh, don't worry about him. He loves having complete strangers on his ship. I don't think that's true. They get his chamber open, asking if he's claustrophobic. Very, he grumbles, and the tank fills up with goo. 56 days into their journey, the ship is quiet and the crew are still in their respective chambers. Weir hears a woman's voice whispering, Billy, causing his eyes to shoot open. He ejects himself from the tank and hears the voice again. I'm so alone. He shouts hello and Cooper's bed door flies open mysteriously. He approaches the pilot's chair, seeing a woman there naked with curly hair. Billy, I'm so cold, she whines. He spins the chair around and her eyes are closed. Claire? He half smiles. Someone puts a hand on his shoulder and when Claire opens her lids, her eyes are gonzo. I'm waiting, she growls and Weir shoots back into the tank, getting expelled for real this time. He's shaken up and Peter and DJ lend him a hand. Cooper then rips on him for his rookie reaction and offers some coffee. Still distraught, he stammers, no thanks. He extends the same offer to Stark. You want something hot and black inside you? Which he declines unamused. Cap whips him into shape. They've got a job to do. Hop to it! There will be plenty of time for sexual harassment later. Peters is watching a video featuring her wheelchair-bound boy, Denny. The others are all horsing around and she gets hit with a ball, ruining the moment. Miller has bad news for her, too. They were unable to get a replacement for her in time but she's already worked things out with her ex. He's gonna get the boy for Christmas and her over the summer. Smith then comes over the PA, informing the crew that they are about two hours from Neptune. They all gather up, and Weir is formally introduced to the gang, and he politely starts by saying that he appreciates being here. Miller isn't buying it. The crew is tired. They're light years away from any 
anything. And the last time a rescue was sent out this far, they lost both ships, painting a pretty bleak picture of the mission. Weird begins by saying that everything discussed here is code black. Ooh, sounds pretty serious. The USAC received a communication, and surprisingly, the source was found to be the Event Horizon. Everyone is taken back at the news, and several call BS. He spills that the cover-up story is that the reactor on the ship went critical and it blew up. That's not true, however, as the ship's true purpose was to create the first ship capable of going faster than light. It's pointed out that that's impossible. He knows that as well, but they can go around it. It creates a dimensional gateway jump from one point to another instantaneously. They are curious how, and he vomits up a bunch of techno jargon that no one understands. So he shows off a simple example utilizing a piece of paper. What's the fastest way between two points? A straight line, Justin pipes up, eliciting chuckles from the others. It's in fact zero, dum-dum. He folds the paper in half, just like space would do. The ship passes through the gateway, and space then returns to normal, utilizing a so-called gravity drive. Well, how the heck does he know so much about it? As it turns out, he built the dang thing, thank you very much. As for what happened for real, everything seemed good. They were given the go-ahead to open a gateway to Proxima Centauri, and then they just pfft, disappeared. As for where it's been the last seven years, that's what they're here to figure out. The only transmission they did receive from the crew doesn't exactly instill confidence, sounding like them all screaming in horrific agony, along with a lot of weird kind of demonic noises too. They hear what sounds like Latin on the recording, and luckily DJ knows a bit of the language, deciphering the phrase, save me. An alarm goes off, and everyone gets into their stations as they are about to reach the ship's beacon. They get closer and closer, but still can't make out anything through the thick storm clouds. A proximity alarm beeps, we're right on top of her. They crest the clouds, and the ship is right there. They quickly reverse thrusters before they collide. We're stupefied seeing the ship again, almost lovingly cooing, there she is, there's my old boy. They do a flyby and take in just how absolutely monstrous in size it is, making the Lewis and Clark look like a, a tiny little ant. He spots an airlock that they can dock with, and Smith starts extending an arm. He urges them to be careful, it's not load bearing, y'all. Smith doesn't listen and jams it right into place, sneering, it is now. Stark can see that the reactor is still hot and the hole is still intact, yet there's no gravity and the thermal units are offline, making it cold enough that the crew could not survive. She does do a life form scan, finding nothing initially. Then there's trace life forms detected, but she can't pinpoint an exact location. They're coming from all over the ship. Hmm. In that case, Miller knows they're gonna have to do this the hard way by suiting up and searching the whole dadgum ship themselves. They make their way across the umbilicus connecting the ships and reach the main door. They crack it open and a huge cloud of pressure is released along with a bunch of random debris. They see it is indeed a deep freeze inside with ice crystals floating around everywhere. They arrive at the main corridor, one side leading to the personnel area while engineering is in the rear. They split up, sending Justin to the back. Miller spots what looks like explosive charges on the ground and Weir tells him that is by design. In case of emergency, you can destroy the corridor to split the ship in half using the front as a lifeboat. I wonder if that will come back later. Nah, doubt it. In the sick bay, there's no sign of casualties, and it's like the place hasn't been used at all. Miller scans the room for life forms, finding nothing. This place is a tomb, he croons in his smooth, velvety voice. He gets a spook from a floating glove and quickly calms himself. Justin has made it to the engineering room at a configuration of odd circular doors. It opens up to a funhouse walkway of rotating, shiny, whirring metal. Justin is confused by what this place is. It allows you to enter the containment area without compromising magnetic fields, says Weir. Duh! But it looks more like a meat grinder to him. On the bridge, Peters finds some crusted blood, and in the lightning flashes see a lot more gore caked on the windows. Weir asked her to turn around, noticing that same almost cross window from Weir's dream at the beginning. He guides her to a ship's log and ejects a disc. It's stuck in the recorder, and she tries to wiggle it to get it loose. Stupid compact discs! A body floats up to her with no eyes, and they wonder what the heck happened here. Decompression, someone guesses, but DJ disagrees. It looks more like an animal attack or something. Justin arrives in the main gravity drive engine room, and is getting some quite strange readings here. He gets the lights on, revealing the majesty of this strange device. A series of rings adorned with lights spinning around a core that at least somewhat resembles the appearance of a biblically accurate angel with the rings and eyes and everything rotating around. The rings stop in formation around the core. Pieces move in a star-shaped area, revealing bright glowing light underneath. The glow gets stronger and then dissipates. They lose signal with Justin, not sure what happened there, but the life form readings just went off the charts. Justin reaches into a dark black 
black shimmering liquid within the core and his hand gets stuck. Something yanks him right in, but luckily he's still attached to a safety line. It starts getting very loosely unspooled and Coop knows that he's in trouble. There's an energy burst that creates a huge ripple effect of explosions and sparks all throughout the ship. It carries over to the Lewis and Clark triggering more sparks and explosions. They try to ascertain what just happened. It must have been due to changing pressure and it even breaches the hole in the Clark. Wow. Coop rushes to Justin's aid. Baby bear, just hold on! He emerges from the blackness and floats right into his arms. He's unconscious, but still alive at least. The situation is especially dire. Not only is the hole breached, but the safety circuits failed too. They don't even have time to weld the breach. We are fucking dead, Smith concludes. Weir has a wacky idea. Why not just go on to the event horizon? It does have air and power. Smith refuses. There's no way he's getting on board that ship. It beats dying, Weir counters. He gets all the ship systems online, the lights on board, allowing us to really see the horizon's monstrous appearance. They aren't out of the woods yet, as they have no radio and no one is coming to save them. Plus, the air is tainted with CO2, and even if they do take the cleaners from the Clark, only leaves them with 20 hours of breathable air. After that, they better be on their way home. Smith is outside doing some repairs, and the gash is pretty serious, letting out precious oxygen into space. It's bigger than expected. He's gonna need more time. Negative, Miller lets him down. 20 hours is all they have. They take in all the masses of gore around and ask Weir for his opinion. He takes a moment to consider his response, but stays silent. They get Justin to the sick bay, and according to DJ, he's stable at least, but isn't sure what could happen. He might wake up in a couple minutes, or possibly never. Coop explains what he saw. He just appeared from that liquid-like substance. Weir smirks, that's not possible, because that would mean the gateway was open. Coop is all, yeah, yeah, that's gotta be it, it was open. And he is actually right. Weir maintains that that couldn't be possible because the drive wasn't activated. Again, sure looked like it was, implying that the ship is already acting on its own accord. Coop argues that is what he saw, and things get heated. Weir blames it on a possible optical effect. Perhaps somehow a burst of gravity waves could have escaped from the core, which could distort space and time. Well, whatever happened hurt Justin and messed up a ship. So just what is in the core? It's complicated, is all Weir says. And Miller fires back, we got time, tell me what's in there. He escorts them to the engine room and explains that when the rings align, it creates an artificial black hole. And this is what allows you to travel anywhere in space. Stark is baffled. A black hole, the most destructive force in the universe, and you created one? Weir brushes past the obvious slight. Yes, indeed. For example, it would take the Clark a thousand years to reach the same point the horizon could reach in a day. That is, if it worked. Miller considers that if they got sucked through the gateway, would they go to wherever the horizon was? Weir admits that theoretically, yes, but there's no way the gateway can open by itself. No, never, ever gonna happen. At least as far as he knows. In that case, Miller wants this room sealed off immediately. It's far too dangerous. Weir maintains there is no danger. It's perfectly safe, buddy. My ship is in shambles and Justin might not make it. That doesn't sound exactly safe. Weir turns his gaze to the drive and as it rotates, it's reflected in his eyes as though it's reaching out to him. Peter scrubs through the log footage, finding nothing useful. There's a weird scratching on fabric heard, but she shrugs it off. She hears it again and assumes that it must be DJ. But after radioing him, finds out he's on another floor entirely. She grabs a surgical blade and slowly goes through the room. She comes to a tent and someone is inside scratching from within at the fabric. She pulls it back and it's her boy Denny inside, seeing his legs are all torn up. Mommy, he cries. Peter starts freaking and DJ shows up, snapping her out of the hallucination. This is our first real example of what the ship is capable of. It kind of latches onto people's traumas and can read their innermost thoughts, creating hallucinations of their trauma. We saw in the earlier video, Denny was in a wheelchair and it seems now that he must have had some kind of accident that paralyzed him. His mom feels guilty and this could also be the reason behind their divorce. All the trauma in a nice convenient package there. They comb through more footage and the captain congratulates his crew, rattling off everyone's name. He says, hail and farewell in Latin, making me think that he was the one saying save me in the recording. Static takes over the footage, hearing more agonizing screams. The power on the horizon starts going wild. A power drain, Weir says, and he knows that it's coming from the core. They go to investigate and unscrew a door in the weird walls, entering a crawl space filled with a green matrix of circuitry. Justin starts convulsing out of nowhere and grumbles, he's coming. His face turns grave, the dark, he says, before returning to writhing violently. Weir navigates the endless green corridors and comes to one sparking. That's the one, he grunts. He yanks out the circuit board and hears Claire calling for him. He tries to return to work and the voice lingers. In a cool Hitchcock-style dolly shot, fear takes over Weir and the lights start cutting out in waves. Weir breathes raggedly and shouts to Miller he's got a problem here. His flashlight starts going on the fritz. Be with 
me, Claire says, and appears right in front of him, all eyeless. Forever, she whispers, and disappears. Miller shouts down the chute for Weir, but he's got his own trauma-based hallucination to tin with. The drive, words to life, and the bottom section catches on fire. A person emerges from the watery flames and eyes Miller accusingly. Once more, we see how the ship can essentially read the crew's mind and manifest their greatest guilt and trauma. The doctor offers the theory that CO2 can cause hallucinations, but Miller knows that what he saw was real. He could even feel the heat from the flames. He turns to Weir. He must have heard something too, right? Weir shifts nervously, and Peter steps in, telling the others about seeing her son. Smith himself hasn't seen anything strange, but still doesn't have a good feeling about the ship. Weir jokes, thanking him for the wonderful scientific analysis, and they nearly come to blows, the tension definitely ratcheting up. It only gets worse when Smith spits that you don't mess with physics and not pay the price, and blames him for killing the old crew. DJ takes his scalpel to his throat, helping to convince him that it's just a ship, a bunch of metal, and there's nothing strange going on. Smith goes at Weir again, and Miller steps in to get him back to the important repair task at hand. We can already feel the effects of the ship here as well. I mean, he didn't need to put a knife to the dude's throat, you know. Clearly, the evil is starting to get to them. Stark has her own working theory based on the little that they really do know. Those bio readings are from an indeterminate origin, thanks. Maybe there's a connection between those readings and everyone's visions. It's almost like the defensive reaction of an immune system. The ship is reacting to them and the reactions are getting stronger. She posits that it feels like the ship brought something back with it, a life force of some kind. Miller is baffled. Are you telling me this ship is alive? She shrugs that he wanted answers and that's the best that she's got. He's more focused on surviving the next 10 hours. Haunted ship from hell be damned. Peter's looking anxious, pacing through the room with Justin still lying on the table. She comes back and he has vanished. She looks for him and a light blinks on a warning of a biohazard. The pulsing light starts getting to her and sparks explode, sending her scrambling from the room. She runs to rejoin the others and no one heard anything that just happened. Another impact thuds at the metal and Weir appears oddly calm. He purposefully gets to his feet intending to open the door and let whatever is out there right in. Stark manages to subdue him and another alarm goes off in the forward airlock. They call all the others and know that it could only be Baby Bear. They find him just in time to see the airlock close with him on the other side with no suit. They alert Miller. They've got an emergency over here. They beg him to open the door and he finally turns around looking haunted. Did you hear it? He asks. Peter says, what is it? It shows you things, horrible things. What does? She presses the dark inside of me from the other place. And he stammers that he's not going back there no matter what. They keep frantically asking him to just open the door. And he groans, if you've seen the things that I have, you wouldn't try to stop me. He does walk over to the control panel and it looks like he's going to open the inner door, but it's the outer one he hits instead. They've got 30 seconds until the door is open. Justin! Miller screeches. Justin! He suddenly changes composure and looks to be back to himself. Now he wants the door open all of a sudden, begging Mama Bear to do so. They can't now because it would depressurize the entire ship, but they promise he's not going to die. We're going to get you out of there. The effects of space start quickly kicking in, his veins turning bulbous. He claws at his eyes and gravity starts to dissipate. Oh God, it hurts, he cries. Miller gets into position with his magnetic boots. He commands the boy to blow all the air out of his lungs. The doors open into the void of space and Justin tumbles through the air, hacking up Blood. Miller makes his big launch and tackles Justin, guiding him back to the airlock. Phew! They pressurize the room and rush to Justin's aid. Surprisingly, still alive, but not looking so good, we can see that Weir is struggling in the captain's chair, the gate still trying to connect with him. DJ has some good news about Baby Bear. He should live, assuming they get out of here before the CO2 levels become lethal. Miller still wants to know what happened to the crew and gets Peters to resume going through that copious amount of footage. They discuss the strange things that Justin said, the dark inside of me and all that. Weir brushes it off as meaningless and slinks away suspiciously. Miller pursues him, telling him, don't walk away from me, mister, sounding like a frustrated dad, hilariously. He wants some answers about all the strange stuff going on here. Weir waffles with some vague explanations, but Miller knows it's all bull. That's all he's gotten from him the whole time he's been on board. He accosts him and further inquires about how the ship works. It creates a gateway to what? And what is this other place exactly? And every time, all Weir can say is, I don't know. He admits that there are things happening here that he doesn't understand. What he really needs is time. Time, Miller scoffs. The one thing we don't have, idiot. Miller storms off and hears a voice calling, Captain, don't leave me, it groans from another corner. Please, for God's sakes, help me from yet another. Miller tries to collect himself. This is all in your head, he chants. He's flooded with a plethora of horrific, hellish, and bloody images. So, you know, maybe it's not all in your head, just partially. Miller discusses his latest encounter with DJ and he recognized the voice as someone that he served with on an early 
earlier crew, Eddie Corrick. There was a big accident on the ship, and Eddie was trapped on board when a fire broke out. He describes the odd properties of fire in zero gravity, even beautiful in a way. The flames hit him in wave after wave, sliding like liquid all over him and screaming for help. It was a tough choice, but all he could do is close the lifeboat hatch and leave the poor guy behind. That day, he swore he would never lose another man. DJ is taken aback. They've known each other for a long while, and he's never even heard that story. That's Miller's whole point. He's never told anybody, but somehow the horizon knew all about it. It knows your fears, your secrets, and it gets in your head and shows them to you. Well, yeah, playing a little catch up there, buddy. DJ has some news that he was concerned about sharing regarding the Latin from the recording. What he first thought was save me is actually save yourself. And it gets worse from hell. Save yourself from hell. If what Weir says is true, the ship has been beyond the known universe, known reality. Who knows where it's been and what it's brought back with it? From hell, Miller scoffs. You don't believe that, do you? As DJ points out, well, whoever recorded that mess is certainly did. Coop radios in that they've got the breaches sealed up. It's time to get off this crazy bitch. Not so fast, as Coop notices they're still venting gas. He needs just another 20 more minutes. Meanwhile, Peters and Stark stumble upon something horrifying in the footage, absolutely disgusted by what they're seeing. They show it to the others, and we get brief glimpses of a horrible hell orgy, someone tearing their eyes out, and all kinds of twisted stuff. It's all very, very brief on screen, but still makes quite an impact. With that, Miller shuts off the footage and is even more determined to get out of here. Weir argues they can't leave, they do have orders. Yeah, well, their orders were to find out what happened to the crew, and they are totally dead. Like, so mission's over, bud. The crew get to work on their final steps, and Weir appeals to him once more. Miller is donezo, and intends on blowing up the ship with missiles until he's satisfied. Stark radios in, saying the bio readings just went nuts again. It looks like the core is draining power from the rest of the ship. He tells her, don't worry about that. Stick to the files. I just want off this ship. Weir eerily tells him, you can't leave. She won't let you. He's sick of his shit, telling him to get his gear or he's going to be walking home. I am home, he slithers and vanishes into the shadows. All right, well, say bye-bye to Dr. Weir. He's off to crazy town. Peters and Smithy are loading up with the carbon cleaner filter dealies, bringing him back to the Clark. Peters gets the last pesky one loose. Man, she has problems with stuck things, huh? She glances back to the engine and it hooks her in, seeing it spinning in her eyes. It shows her flashes of her boy, and she drops everything running after the hallucination. He dashes down a corridor nearby. Vinny's up on the next floor, and she quickly ascends the ladder after. She keeps endlessly following Denny, to the point of being out of breath. There's then a brief flash in her mind of what looks like her own death. Denny is then on the other side of the room, luring her towards him. He flashes a zombie-like smile, and she walks right into a long-ass chute, crashing into the bottom in a shower of blood. Just like that vision from moments ago, Denny leans over looking quite pleased with himself and disappears into the fog. Weir stumbles into the engine room and notices Peters. He feigns concern and sees that her eyes are now black. It's his turn to face his demons. Billy, Claire whispers. He's transported back to their apartment and sees Claire's reflection in the mirror. It's me, I'm home, he smiles, but she doesn't seem to notice continuing to apply makeup. He confesses that he knows that he wasn't there when she needed him and apologizes for letting work get between them. Some deleted scenes made it more clear that he was more in love with the ship than his wife. I think we do still get the picture here. She draws a bath. Please, no, not again, he begs. Yet she continues undeterred. You can imagine where things are going, but it's obvious that Weir feels guilt for losing Claire. He breaks down emotionally, and Claire appears, taking him in her bosom. It's all right. You'll never be alone again, she coos. She pulls his head back, telling him, we have such wonderful things to show you. Dang, really stepping on Hellraiser's toes there. Literally just changed a couple of words around. She opens her eyelids, revealing that she has no peepers, and goes to gouge out his, too. But in reality, see that he is doing it to himself, screaming in pain. Coop gets his shoddy repair done, pleased with himself as usual. Smith is ready to go, seeing Weir descending down to the airlock. He radios Miller about him, and he notices that one of those charges is missing. He tells him he's gotta get out of there. The explosives could be on board. Smith doesn't want to give up. They just got done putting the ship back together. He furiously digs through a bunch of random crap, and while he does find the charge, it's too late. It counts down from three and explodes, completely destroying the Clark. Coop finds himself in a difficult predicament, riding a piece of debris and getting hurt deeper into space. He curses the situation and tries to think of a plan. He decides to blow his air tanks to propel him back. It reaches maximum charge and he launches triumphantly back towards the ship shouting, here I come motherfuckers! Miller updates DJ that the ship is gone and if you see Weir take his ass out, DJ doesn't even get the chance as eyeless Weir is already there. He lifts him by the throat launching him into a column and then decides to do a little bit of surgery of his own. Miller runs in later finding DJ splayed out on the ceiling with his skin stretched out and organs splatter all over the table. Miller is now even more determined to take down the mad doctor. Okay, buddy, you don't want to leave, you never will. He stalks his way through the ship, finding Stark on the ground and unresponsive.
impressive. Some smelling salts rouse her, and he helps her to her feet. The captain's chair spins around with Weir at the helm. Oh my god, Willer groans at the sight. What happened to your eyes? Where we are going, we don't need eyes to see, Weir responds. The horizon was created to see beyond the stars, but it's gone further than that. It tore a hole in our universe, a gateway to another dimension, a pure evil, pure chaos. When it crossed over, it was just a ship, but when she came back, it's straight up alive. He tells Miller to take in the ship's appearance. Isn't she beautiful? Well, your beautiful ship killed its crew. He smirks back, and now she has another crew. She has us. He slams a button, setting the gateway to open with a countdown of 10 minutes. Stark makes a move, and he bats her away. Miller goes for it, and Weir yoinks his nail gun thing. If you miss, it'll blow the hole, Miller warns. What makes you think I'll miss? Weir fires back. Coop then appears, flying towards the window to try to save the day. Not so much, as Weir fires and blows a hole right through the window. Coop is sent reeling, and everything starts getting violently sucked into space through the hole. Weir screams insanely, and his chair is ripped right out of the floor, slamming outside. He, along with Miller, hang on for dear life to the floor grating. Weir loses his grip and gets sucked right out into space. Well, that's the end of him, right? Nope. Miller grabs onto a random cable and pulls with all his strength to fight against the suction. He makes it through the door, seeing Stark is still alive. He stops the poker in place to force the door open, and after some struggling, he gets her hand, dragging her over to safety. There's another alarm from the front section, and they ready themselves as the door opens. But it can't be Weir, right? That's Coop, who tumbles out, and they get his helmet off. It's not over yet, as Weir has set the timer on the gate, and they gotta shut it down. When it comes to how, it's thanks to Weir's own suggestion, setting all the charges to blow and using the front part of the ship as a lifeboat. Told you that'd come back. Thanks, Weir. They split up, and Miller gets the charges activated, while Coop turns on the emergency beacon. Blood dribbles down his hand, and when looking up, the ceiling panels are also filled with it, and they start pouring down the walls. One of the gravity couches starts filling up, and once it reaches capacity, the glass shatters, sending out a deluge of blood. We're supposed to actually see Weir being reconstituted bit by bit in the tank, but alas, this whole thing was cut. Miller encounters his old flaming buddy once more, who launches him into the wall with a thunk. Eddie stomps up, accusing him of leaving him behind. Miller knows better. You're not him. I watched you die. He shapeshifts into Weir's appearance. The ship brought me back, he growls. I told you it won't let me leave. It won't let anyone leave. He scolds him for trying to destroy the ship. It's defied time and space and been to places you can't imagine. You can't just blow it up. And it's time to go back. Yeah, back to hell, Miller grumbles. Weir, or really a representative now of whatever evil has taken over the ship, clarifies, yeah, it's not exactly hell. It's easier to just show you. And he puts a hand on Miller's head, treating him to visions of his crew being brutally tortured in an admittedly quite hellish landscape. You can't have them, Miller shrieks and wallops Weir with a scrubber. He catches the next blow and smashes Miller to the floor. He fills in more details of just who he is. He's not the devil. He's older than the devil. I watch the beginning and I will see the end. I am the dark behind the stars. I am the dark inside you all. Miller struggles to his feet and Weir kicks him away. The tables turn when Miller pulls the detonator from the liquid. Go to hell, he smirks and smashes the button. And an explosion races through the main access corridor, propelling the front away. A black hole appears and sucks the gravity drive along with anything else in its path into a swirling black hole that quickly seals itself shut. Stark and Coop watch the destruction, her mourning the loss of Miller. Thanks for the sacrifice, though. Appreciate ya. Weir's little monologue, in addition to every other tidbit given thus far, along with some deleted moments, gives us our best insight as to what exactly the evil is that possessed the event horizon. While the dimension certainly resembles hell, based on Weir saying that he's older than the devil, watch the beginning and all that, it hints at something even more ancient, calling to mind the great old ones of H.P. Lovecraft. There's another moment when Weir shows Miller visions at the end that was cut from the original script, showing us explicitly an alien sun described as red, bloated, and dying. Amongst the alien terrain, there is a sluggish, oily black sea, just like the substance in the gate, and a hand reaches from the oil. That's all we get, but back in the original script from 92, there are mentions of tentacles. So it really seems that they were going more for the Lovecraftian thing than hell specifically, but that idea still works in the theatrical cut with less details, because it really is more about the horror of the unknown. That's the scariest thing there is. After 72 days, a rescue team tracks down the wreckage of the ship. A group of people come on board, donned in full evac suits. They find the gravity couch is still intact, finding three survivors, Coop, Stark, and Justin. Man, that kid's lucky after everything he's went through. Luckily, the couch 
is still have power too, and they crack open Stark's tank. A crew member opens their visor, revealing Weir's grinning face underneath. She jolts back to the real rescue, still with Coop, trying to assure her that they are safe. Although I'm not so sure, seeing the outer door close on its own, implying that the evil is still lingering on board. Sure, the drive got sucked into the black hole, but they state several times there are life readings throughout the entire vessel, meaning the whole ship is tainted by the evil from the other place. I think they are all ultimately doomed, and the same vicious cycle is about to start all over again. All this in spite of the quite definitive The End title at the conclusion. Do we really need that? Which kicks us right back into the best that techno of the day had to offer, thanks to The Prodigy. That's some funky shit. The song is literally called Funky Shit. Of course it is. Now we know all about the mysterious event horizon and what befell its crew, but there is a lot more to the movie itself as nearly 30 minutes were cut before release. Stay tuned for a video on that coming soon. Until then, why not click over there for some more cosmic horror? Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.